Thank you very much. Once again, thanks to Chris and Tony for inviting me. Um, I want to thank Mike Rizzo, who's here, um, one of our residents, for helping with this. And then, you know, I was just thinking, uh, Daniel Briggy is here, who, Chris, you operated on in high school, and then was not only a, he was a club baseball player at Miami, then he became a varsity player, then he became a pitcher, then a medical student, and now he's a resident down in Houston. So, you know, and, and then he pitched against the Columbia in the Super Regionals, I think. <laughs> <laughs> He's a Westchester kid, so however it goes. All right. Um, so I have no conflicts of interest related to this. Um, and, you know, every year, especially at the major league level, we talk about, well, why are we doing or not doing things? And we've actually done more on the collegiate level. We're really fortunate. Our kinesiology department's across the street from baseball. And... Um, one of the things I did in 2008 when everybody was kind of out of money was to get everybody together on campus that was interested in sports. And so we have a sports medicine institute that includes orthopedics, obviously, but also our primary care, uh, biomedical engineering, kinesiology, the nursing school, the athletic department, the athletic training group. Um, so bringing everybody together. And then that also includes our stem cell group and genomics. Uh, which has really been helpful, especially when we get certain questions and the genomics people just look at us and say, uh, you know, these parents are out of their minds. Um, I put this up, Mike put this up, um, Cora, who's the manager of the Red Sox on the left when he was in Miami and on the right, um, although I, I happen to just know that I need to admit before somebody raises their hands, yes, he did say he learned how to steal signs at Miami. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, We'll, we'll go through some of what the definition of performance science is. We'll talk about how those factors really influence performance, uh, pre-screening athletes, um, the injured athletes, and then back to elite play, some of the things we're doing in, in terms of conclusion. Some of this actually, you know, as I went through the talk, you start to say to yourself, wow, this is like that commercial. This is the master of the obvious. But getting everyone coordinated, and then I, I really enjoyed in the last talk, now, Mike said in the end to Kevin that it was very important that the coaches actually know we're, we're doing something. And so, you know, the, the college athletes, especially around football, we've spent a fortune on catalysts and these different programs that are GPS systems. And we know how fast somebody's running and everything else, but we really don't know how to put it into perspective yet. So what is performance science and how does that work? And I really look at it as the multidisciplinary study of human performance. And that includes biomechanics, it includes physiology, it includes psychology. Um, I think that's an important piece. And then it's the economics, right? Which people have used multiple different terms for this, you know, whether it's sabermetrics or, or anything else. But, you know, how are you figuring out that what you're doing is right? And I think that the most important part of the economics is just what, what are your metrics? What metrics of success do you have? And then understanding these fundamental skills, the mechanisms, and then how do we optimize performance? So a couple of interesting things. It turns out that um, humans are, we're one of the only uh, mammals that sweat, right? So we can run for, we lost the slides, guys, got it. So we can, we have the ability to dissipate heat that way. We don't have to stick our tongues out or, or do other things. And so although we're not the fastest creatures, we actually have that ability because sweating is not dependent on breathing to have, you know, superior endurance running. So one of the things that we were talking about when we were getting this talk together is, you know, there, there are tribes in Africa that will just chase animals all day. These animals that are much faster, and then eventually they'll, they'll be able to run them down when they exhaust the animals. So when you think about this, when you think about running, and you look at running, it's, it's good to look at those metrics just to know what are we capable of. And then more importantly, as we move past what we're capable of, how do we put it in order, especially, let's say, around baseball? And these are just some of the some of the papers that have been written on this. But we probably, over other animals, have the ability to work at higher temperatures. One of the reasons I bring this up around baseball is very interesting what Kevin was saying about activating the brain, no matter how you're thinking of cognition. Um, because people have thought about this for a while, and actually we got it from our neurosurgery colleagues, that, for instance, when you go to shoot baskets in a basketball game or our quarterbacks come off and they're trying to talk about what they just saw, if we can cool them down, and we've tried all kinds of tricks, ice on the wrist, cooling towels, et cetera, you actually do better. And then looking at velocity and, and, and temperature. So these are some of, some of the ways, and is there a limit to human performance, right? So we look at, at what those are and, and how it evolves. So let me go through this. So 
if you look at the 100 meter dash, for instance, it was about 9.43 meters per second. Then you look at Dave Syme, he went 10-2, okay, in 1960. And then you look at Bolt, he went 10.44. So he's an entire step, an entire meter ahead of everybody else. Um, I put this in, uh, actually, sometimes if you, if you look at these things, you remember them better if there's a little antidote. Dave Syme was an ophthalmologist when I first moved to Miami. He's since passed, very well-known guy. Most people didn't realize that he had the world record in the 100. He won the silver in, in Rome. Uh, but if you look at that body type, he, he's actually playing in the NFL right now, or at least his grandson is. He had very successful uh, kids uh, athletically. His daughter played soccer. At, she actually went to my kid's high school, played soccer at Stanford. I married a guy named McCaffrey, and now their son Christian is uh, with the 49ers. Prior to Christian, though, I could tell you, Dave was at Duke. This I found really interesting. And in between third and fourth year of, of medical school was when he actually ran in the Olympics. He's a fascinating guy. Um, also, uh, the U.S. used him uh, to try to get a, a Russian spy during the Olympics. That's a separate story. But he, he actually was always kind of low-keyed what he was doing. But it does bring up the question of genetics, right, and the question of elite performance. So this is the best we've done in a marathon. Um, and last week, I think it was 208 that won New York, 207, 208, which is flying. Um, and the conditions really play, play a pace. So what are our limits to maximum performance, and can we get to two hours? Well, you would think that somebody's going to knock off the last, the last minute or two you know, in a legal fashion. So when it comes to genetics and what genetic markers and how do we do things, you know, the more we've talked to our, our genetics institute about this, and we can look at you know, the entire DNA chain, we really talk about epigenetics. So it's not what your genetics are, but how you're using them. And there's just a lot about lifestyle that comes in. Sleep, um, telomeres, which, which are showing how you're aging, um, your diet, the way, the way you live your life, your lifestyle, that, that are really pretty critical because you're not going to change your genetics. But the question becomes, can you optimize performance based on genetics? Now, that, that comes into that last talk, right? Obviously, if you had the seven foot four guy, I think that was the example, you can throw 300 feet, but the six foot three may get hurt. So how does that really work? And, you know, we've seen, I don't know if you can get this other thing off, but, you know, we've seen all these companies promise things and, and go through it. And, you know, they're trying to get kids to, you know, parents to optimize genetics. It's probably not the best thing to do, right? So getting people in the, in the right area. But we looked at this and we looked at, you know, could you increase power? Can we get associations there? Um, is there a diversity ancestrally that helps? And then what are the phenotypic characterizations? And the, the main reason to do these things is to figure out, okay, the athletes in front of us, are we doing the best thing we can? And how can that help? So in moving towards baseball, what do we look for? Um, physical performance, obviously. The nutritional status. If you look at what's going on now versus what went on, in clubhouse in the past is dramatically different. And the top players, you know, are, are built differently and they're going through the season differently um, in, terms of, in terms of their wear. And what we've seen is, you know, when you have a lot of adipose tissue in the trunk, um, especially later in the season and extra weight, it, it can make a difference. We look at people's psychological status, probably pretty important if you're in a hitting slump or a pitching slump, how are you doing? And so we have sports psychology work with both our major league team and we use it a ton uh, in college. One of the things we did was we actually moved the sports psychologists out of the, we have a large training room in the University of Miami and put them in our health center, which is a, a block away, so that the student athletes felt like they could really work on it. So yes, they're dealing with things, but what you don't realize when you're, you know, you're watching a college football game, for instance, yeah, that kid's 19 years old and everybody's watching, they're not really pros. Somebody broke up with them or didn't go on a date that week. They had a test. Their mom's sick. Like all these other things come in that we've found to be important. What their cognitive performance is. This is really on the performance end, but just looking at Kevin's, you know, the almost the heat maps of the brain, that makes a lot of sense. And then we look a lot of environmental changes in Miami, um, especially around heat, playing in the cold, how, how that affects us. And then sleep. We've been tracking, using the WHOOP, we've been tracking sleep, it's almost too specific, 
but we can look at this uh, in detail. The University of Florida several years ago did a really interesting study where they were looking at athletes that went out on Wednesday and Thursday night. It was a dramatic decrease in performance on Saturday. It had nothing to do with, with alcohol or drug consumption. It was literally just what loss of sleep did you have at that point? And then obviously pain, and pain can decrease performance. So we look at this in terms of aerobics, strength and conditioning, muscular endurance. We want to track flexibility, not only at the beginning of the season, but as it goes, along with power. What their nutritional status is, we've been doing a lot with taking blood at the beginning of the year. Our non-ops really find that important, especially vitamin C, vitamin D, K, looking at that. You'd be shocked at how many athletes, especially track athletes and African-American athletes, have a decrease in some of those areas. Their cognitive performance, we feel, is very important in terms of their performance, their reasoning, their adaptability. We are starting to look at emotional intelligence and, and perceptual learning. We definitely know that kids that have learning disabilities take longer to come back from any uh, post-concussive episode, and then how is that actually affecting their performance on the field? And then there's you know the psychological status, which we do a number of different psychological tests, but most mostly just have somebody there for them when needed. And then we're looking at the environmental status, obviously, um, that everybody else is looking at. Sleep is something we've really pushed. We've changed uh, some of the ways, you know, in MLB, it's very difficult to do with the schedule. But in college, we've been able to go a day earlier, stay. Nobody stays really after the games. Everybody gets out of there. But one of the things we're doing is getting the nutrition and the sleep patterns better coming off of road trips. It used to be we would get we would come back, especially in football, you know, four or five in the morning from a night game, and then all of a sudden everybody wanted the the training room full at 10 a.m. We we've gotten a lot smarter about that, what we do, how we do it, and giving people recovery days and understanding that recovery is part of performance, and then looking at pain and talking about how to do it. Um, you know, Kevin Kevin stole this, so I'll I'll go back, I'll skip through it, but I think. We've looked at a lot of different things around sleep. Um, the most interesting thing around sleep is probably not only performance, but your mental cognition while, while you're doing that. And that seems pretty obvious, especially if you have to listen to me at now four o'clock in the afternoon. Your, pro your mental cognition is probably a little bit down. But how you can do that, looking at injury related to sleep. And a lot of it's probably very similar to what we just heard in the last session with regard to how patients are recovering even the example of landing on the correct leg. And we've had injuries in basketball where we're seeing that the GPS is getting a little slower, they're moving more slowly. It's probably very similar to what Kevin was describing. You know, you jump up and you have to make this immediate decision. If you're not really there, that's a problem. In saying this, the other thing we are looking at is alcohol and marijuana. You know, marijuana has now become, the NCAA has kind of taken the reins off of it, but there's a definitive difference in terms of what we're seeing um, in, when you sit and talk to coaches with kids that test positive. And then obviously there's a huge range. So we're actively pursuing education as a means to decrease what they're doing, but it does mess up their, their sleep habits as well. You do not go into deep sleep and REM the same when you have marijuana on board and you have alcohol on board. We've changed how we're fueling based on where we are in the season. So we're looking at, you know, obviously using lean proteins for the most part, um, energy enhancing foods with the grains, fruits and vegetables. And the most important thing, it's almost like healthcare is access. So we've developed an entire room. We have nutritionists, but it's really having plenty of food available when athletes are hungry, that's healthy. When I first got to Miami, the first football game, now I came from the University of Wisconsin where food was not an issue. But when I got to Miami, the first football game, there was basically Gatorade in the locker room at halftime and before the game. And I remember telling the, telling the trainer, Steve's friend, Vinny, that it was, it, this was going to be a problem. There was, there, you know, whether you believe in gels, whatever you do. So now we actually have healthy proteins, we have fruits, we have fast acting kind of things. And then looking at fat and looking at the, uh, that ability as well. Hydration, I mean, it's almost like, you know, the, the movie Waterboy, but, but keeping that going. But we actually show the athletes, similar to when people will use a urinal and looking at the different hydration, we show the athletes at different points of the year what your plate should actually look like. And we've had pretty good success on that. Also, having the athletes have a nutritionist when they eat, it's very interesting. The athletes that really care, which it's a big peer pressure thing, 
they'll actually look at it, look at each other and say, oh, no, you hit it. You did this because they're so competitive. You have the right amount of vegetables. You have the right, and that's that's very helpful. And they change it on easier days and hard days. So our recovery meals on Sunday are different than others. One of the things that still bothers me, I had a conversation with our head football coach about it last week. I don't know if you ever travel with a pro or college football team, but there's there's no bigger amount of food eaten ever. In fact, we tell our fellows, if you want to put on 10 pounds, keep, keep eating with the, the guys. They eat before we leave. We're on a plane at one where you can get burgers and, and steak sandwiches, et cetera. We land and at 5.30 we have a full meal and at 8.30 they have snack, which is basically bigger than whatever was out there with ice cream and everything else. And my argument is we should really be doing that the day after the game because that load and everything else. And so we're moving in that direction. Um, hydration, we don't have to go through too much. I will say something that, that most teams are doing for sure in the South just because of the rules and regulations because we're always above on the bulb in terms of how hot it is on heat index is we weigh before and after. And that's been very helpful, especially coming off of injury. What we've noticed in some of the concussed kids don't start eating appropriately. So it's very interesting when you look at injury, especially um, mental cognition and concussion, how that affects these other factors. But we've seen that as, as a problem that we're working on. Um, we, we, really around our female athletes for obvious reasons. We really look at um, iron deficiency. We will do blood tests always when they come in and once a year. And for certain athletes, we'll do them more often. Um, and, and we just follow a lot of the regulatory things that are out there. Um, we know the effects of vitamin D, especially around gaining and muscle gain. And we've looked at that in terms of how it affects other, other athletes in general. One a couple of interesting things, Mike found this. Um, in many sports, you do have a home field advantage. In baseball, it doesn't seem like there is. Um, part of that, especially at the MLB level, maybe because you're you're used to it and you're kind of camping out for three or four days. There's definitely an issue when you're traveling. So one of the things that we've been talking about, which is really almost, you know, it sounds sci-fi-ish, but you know, there's this whole group of airplanes being sold now that are going to go about twice as fast. So one of the things that we've been talking about is it'll be interesting to see how that affects performance. Um, I'm going to kind of skip through. I know I'm, I'm getting low on time. Um, one of the things that, you know, the Rockies could talk about more um, in terms of their cardiovascular health, I'm sure they're there. Um, in terms of how the ball flight, that may even itself out a little bit. Um, we looked at common injuries. I'm going to skip through this because we've talked about this most of the day and just talk about a couple of things that we look at. We definitely look at... It, we are doing pre-screening, and this was one of the things we showed Chris when he was down, we're doing pre-screening so that we can do a lot of prehab well before injury, and we're doing that especially in football, uh, baseball, and basketball. And so we've actually developed with our school of music, so if you make a bad step, you're, you're, you have something and it's telling you, and we've developed this whole line of testing that can, sh where you're doing L tests, you're doing different sprint-based tests to really work on balance and agility. And we found that in doing these and going through this, this was a small guy, about six, seven, he was with the Bills for a while, but how they stand, how they're moving, and then we have a baseline for if they do get injured, but we also can work immediately doing physical therapy before that. And these are some of the agility drills. It'd be interesting um, to use some of the things that Kevin said to actually move them where they're not knowing where they're going. But having all of these as a baseline is great. We've done a lot of work now. Um, we used to talk about flock of birds. Our kinesiology department um, has done a lot in terms of light sensors. So we're now working on which muscles are firing, are they firing at the right time. We've done it mostly with injured players, post ACL, but we're starting to do it with, with all athletes. Um, this leads into this eight week long preseason rehab. And that'll help specifically with lower body mobility and proprioception, their endurance strength. Um, and then we've looked at inspiratory muscles. That's a totally separate talk that people could give, especially around pitching. And there are a lot of natural asymmetries. I like the slide with the, the guy that was bulked on one side and not on the other. Looking at those, I think, are important. We'll kind of fly through this. Um, and then we look, when we come back from injury, we try to pre-screen them and prevent injury, but once they're there, it's really this 
this team effort around what we can do. And we almost always find that athletes want to shut it down when they're injured. We've had much better success. And, and my basis for this is on is from the oncology world and breast cancer. Women who are exercising during chemo or radiation have a better response both to the medicine, how they feel, and getting rid of cancer. And so we've looked at that metabolically, and we think, uh, talking to our oncology group, that we should be doing that for all our athletes. So we do not let them sit back. They have to be working right away. And so this is kind of how we look at it. The immediate post-op, the early rehab, we look at a controlled ambulation, especially for lower extremity, and then advancing them and getting back to sports-specific work. Um, and then our return to play metrics are specific based on the injury and getting all of this group together. And I'll, I'll put this up quickly. Um, I know I'm over at this point. Um, and really, when we look at this and we talk to athletes, one of the things we will talk to them, we like, it's better to talk to them when they've had a good day than if they've had a bad day and say, what did you do that trying to reinforce it instead of beat him up? What did you do that you threw a two hitter, right? What did you do? differently. And sometimes there are one or two things they point out and sometimes they say nothing really, really changed. Our recovery is, is something we really focus on, especially with the college pitchers because they have about a week between starts. So the final thoughts are to optimize. I think you need a multidisciplinary team. I think the athletes may not be knowledgeable, but remember they're very competitive. And so knowing their game day performance can improve by what little steps they're taking is helpful. The pre-screening can be really important to mitigate injuries in the future. And then we have this entire team that we put together. Thank you very much. Sorry I ran over.